evening, everybody. We're going to get started here in about one minute. Uh, give me just one minute and we'll get going. Thanks. All right, board members, if you're here, could you go ahead and turn your video on? And if uh, you're not a board member, go ahead and turn your video off for now. All right, so. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so this is uh, the November 4th, 2020 meeting of the Valley of the Sun Waldorf Education Association Board of Directors. Uh, the, of course, that is the board that runs their Desert Marigold School and is in charge of its uh, oversight and financial integrity. Uh, we are the board members, it is our meeting. Uh, we and occasionally invite certain people into our meetings and you will see some extra panelists with us this evening. We have a few board member applicants to interview. That's gonna happen last. Um, and then uh, we also have our interim executive director. But uh, before we get too far, let me read the opening verse. The true aim of education is to awaken real powers of perception and judgment in relation to life and living, for only such an awakening can lead to true freedom. And that's from Rudolf Steiner. So uh, why don't we start by introducing ourselves, board members. John Elling, um, unfortunately, is not going to make it tonight, so let me know. Um, so we're going to keep moving and carry on as best we can without him. So I am Gregory Schneider, I'm the board president and a parent of two kids at the school. Uh, Nathaniel, you wanna go next? Yeah, I'm Nathaniel Allen. I uh, am a board member and a parent of uh, three kids at the school. And how about April? April Sauer, board member and secretary. And Mr. Tanner. John Tanner, board member. All right. Thank you all. All right. So we're going to try and keep this meeting to two hours tonight, uh, which is ambitious, I know, but I think we can do it if we stay focused and uh, try to keep some time limits on our discussion. So we're going to start off with COVID-19 related matters. Um, Teresa, what? If you could uh, join us for this part of the conversation and just give us an update on uh, any issues the school is facing. At, at, well, actually, why don't you spend 30 seconds and introduce yourself to everybody. So, uh, for many watching, this will be the first time they've seen you or get to hear from you. So please start there. Sure. So uh, I'm Teresa Marzoff. I am the interim executive director. My first day was last Monday. Um, and I pretty much from Phoenix, <laughs> not a lot to tell. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been a great start, uh, meeting the team so far and, um, it's beautiful school, very welcoming community. Um, so it's been great. Perfect. Uh, thanks for that. And, uh, for the benefit of those in the audience, Teresa has lots and lots of experience helping teams through transition periods and working collaboratively. She has a wealth of uh, HR experience and uh, has been doing a great job uh, really diving in deep in, in her first week and a few days. So we're glad to have you, have you aboard. 
So uh, turning now to our agenda item, um, so we're going to start talking about COVID-19. Uh, so if you could just let us know any of the issues that the school is facing that you think uh, we might need to consider. Um, most recently, it's been uh, the communication approach. So um, we have realized that although the guidelines have been laid out, who is notified when and how um, wasn't. So that's something that I, in partnership with the LDC, are working on currently, just so there's no question of who gets certain communications um, so that we're communicating consistently. Everyone in the know is in the know. Um, I would say the other thing we've gotten a lot of questions around the face mask policy, um, primarily around face shields. Uh, this continues to come or um, things aside from face masks. So when there is not enough distance in the classrooms, uh, whether or not other things like shielded desks uh, can be used or things to help um, you know, minimize any type of exposure. So this is really um, started to, well, started, I assume, um, but this seems to be, uh, I don't really know any different, but this has been an ongoing question since I've been there. And is there a, a plan to help clarify everyone's expectations around those things? Because so, I know we have a face mask policy that's on our, our website, but it sounds like we have more work to do in making everyone's understanding of that consistent. We're uh, st yes, we've been communicating or recommunicating and directing people to this existing policy. Um, also, we did have a recent close. Um, uh, a close um, encounter, I guess, with COVID. Uh, and um, that really helped us to reinforce um, the importance of the safety protocols and measures that have been put in place. So we used it as an opportunity to remind staff um, and faculty and parents and students. Um, so I think those have helped. But um, what seems to be the pressing question is the... Um, um, uh, face shields in substitute of the face mask, uh, can that be used as an accommodation when an accommodation is needed by a student? Um, that one is, uh, you know, a, a little more tricky and the policy doesn't exactly speak to that situation. What kind of accommodation can be made um, when a student indicates uh, or a parent indicates the student requires an accommodation? Uh, thank you. Uh, board members, any questions of Teresa right now on this issue? Not sure if Mr. Tanner is trying to unmute himself or looked like might be trying to speak. Nope. Okay. Um, all right. So let's move on. I want to, um, I'm going to pull up uh, the state benchmarks uh, about where we are in terms of um, the three benchmarks that the state set. And I, I just want to take a look at those. I know we sent out an email. They're still the same uh, as they have been uh, because the, the data is not updated until Thursday, uh, usually sometime in the morning. Um, but I'm just going to share my screen here. So we can take a look at them and then discuss um, w what might be on the horizon and uh, making sure that everyone expectations are on the same page about what's going to happen uh, moving forward uh, as we see cases rising around the country, but more importantly, rising in our own community. All right, so let me share my screen. All right, so is that showing up for everybody? Yeah, okay, so the 
both Arizona State Department of Health Services and Maricopa County set well, three benchmarks for determining uh, the recommended delivery model for instruction. Uh, and those three benchmarks are how many cases are there for 100,000 individuals, what's the percent positivity rate, and how many hospital visits for COVID-like illnesses are there in a particular region. Um, so this is just for Maricopa County. Um, and we can see that the trend is, you know, back in September 20th, it was 48, 27th was 53, October 4th is 70, October 11th is 84, and this case is per 100,000. Uh, so ticking up, getting pretty close to this dotted line here, which is um, once you move across that line, um, that would be substantial transmission. And uh, both the state and the county recommend once any of these factors crosses this yellow line here, and, it, and then it would go into a substantial transmission category, that's when the first week that happens, schools should prepare for offering uh, virtual only learning and on-site support services. If there's a second consecutive week sustained where you're above that line, then the, the, both the state and the county recommend switching at that point uh, as soon as you can to virtual learning only with on-site support services. Uh, so that that's the recommendation. It's not a binding guidance. Um, this is where we are. And the, the other piece of the situation is that we voted as a board back um, in August, I believe, to uh, reopen the school for in-person instruction when uh, these three factors uh, were at least below this yellow line. And in the case of percent positivity, uh, this has changed a little bit. It, the, the guidance used to be 7% or below. It looks like they've changed it to 10%. Or below here, uh, positivity. So, uh, I would like to clarify moving forward what are the conditions in which we would switch back to virtual learning? Because I, I think we need to be able to do that and know that it's going to be communicated quickly. And, and so, everybody knows what the plan is and what the criteria are for switching to virtual and then switching back to hybrid. At, at, because as I think you all know with COVID now, it, it comes in waves. Uh, we see it go up, and then we see it go down, and then we see it go up. Um, so I think we can predict we're seeing an up wave here. So I think we need to know what to do, even when it gets higher. I hope it doesn't, but probably it will. And then what happens when it starts going back down again? So um, board members, I shared with you my proposal uh, before the meeting, which was to uh, keep the school open or to reopen for in-person and hybrid instruction when um, all three of these factors uh, are met, uh, and then to begin switching or to switch to virtual only with on-site support services when um, any one of these factors uh, indicates that there's substantial transmission. So th that's what I'm proposing, um, but I want to open it up for discussion because uh, uh, I think this is important to hear from uh, everybody on. I don't have much to say other than I agree with that. That's all I got. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, April. Nathaniel, Mr. Tanner, thoughts? Um, it, it's just, it's, it's a complicated subject, you know, and so I think I think the intent, intent initially mm -hmm. was working forward towards um, a criteria to reopen, and I don't assume that that uh, the opposite, you know, reciprocal trajectory necessarily means that I would 
say my logic was to be able to go in and out of open versus closed. Um, I think my primary driving factor is whether or not our local community is at risk. And I think there are other mechanisms that we've contemplated as far as risk mitigation at the school being open and whether or not a certain number of cases in this cohorted setting would trigger a cohort uh, to close. I don't, I don't look at the county aggregated data necessarily as directly representative of our community at this stage. So, you know, I, I, if, if one toggles up and it means that, that the, the spread is, is, is increasing or has increased, I, I don't know if 101 versus 99 are materially different. And if we accept the criteria you're talking about, one would be we go back to just virtual and the other is we wouldn't. And so I just, I, you know, we reopen for lots of reasons, not just these three indicators. And so I would hate to oversimplify the idea. You know, obviously, if there's a governor mandate, we, we would we would go back to virtual. You know, there, there, there are just other things I think we need to consider and contemplate. So I don't know that this is even a discussion yet that we can have substantively um, to undo what was done using this this data and this logic. Well, I, I think we we as a board need to have a very good reason if we're not going to follow what the state and the county are recommending that we do as a school uh, for the health of our students. And, and I, I hear you when you're saying while our school is different, we're not just, you know, like we have our own set of mitigation factors. That's true. And so does every school that's open for any purpose right now. And yet the guidance is still, you need to consider these and we recommend taking this course of action when you see these things being met. So I, I, I recognize that there are many reasons why we reopened the school. Um, but my concern is if we can agree on a path now for when the, the, the community risk of spread is too high, what is our, what is our plan? Because trying to make decisions when we're three weeks or four weeks into substantial transmission, um, it doesn't seem to be, it, it seems less than ideal. Um, now we actually have benchmarks. Uh, that are established by public health professionals. Um, so if there's a reason why we're not going to follow them, I think we need to have a pretty clear basis for doing something different. Yeah, I don't, I, I feel like some of what you're saying may be assuming what my motivation or uh, um, perspective is on it. And I, I, I would just ask that, as I look at it right now, I look at the data that you just put up, it is recommending a hybrid program and that's what we're doing. And so I'm not suggesting that we don't follow what their instruction is. I'm saying that when their instruction changes, that's when we then have a decision to make. And so I don't know if planning based on a criteria is necessarily required because if they say, hey, it's time that you guys shut down, then we as the board would have to say, yes, we follow that or no, we don't. And I'm not saying that we wouldn't, you know, I just, right now it says hybrid. And so we're following hybrid and I'm, I'm satisfied with that. Right. And I understand that, but the point is that they've indicated very clearly the conditions under which their recommendation will change. So we, so we know if certain criteria are met, their guidance will change. And we know what that guidance is going to be. So why would we wait until we're until after the fact to, to react when we can actually make a plan now and everybody will know what's going to happen? Mr. 
Mr. Tanner, your thoughts? So I'm grateful that the board has allowed the school to reopen. This is extremely precious time for uh, the, the children at the school who needed to be able to, for the ones that can do it, uh, to be able to see each other again and to be able to, to laugh and, and uh, learn and, and do all the things that, uh, that we're famous for. But I do wish to be extremely cautious and uh, I agree with Mr. Allen. Uh, one, you know, one person, you know, difference between one person and, you know, going from 99 to 101, I, that's not going to make a difference. But if it starts to go up there, I agree with you, Mr. Schneider, that we do need to have a plan to, uh, to go back to uh, remote learning. Uh, I have way too much respect for you know, the community and the children to uh, jeopardize the school in any way. So whatever I could do to help formulate that plan, uh, I, I support that. I would so, say so, probably, probably within, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, go ahead. I, I would probably say you know, that we need to be able to, to, to very quickly uh, let the community know that we're, that these, and I know you have already done that, but that these benchmarks are starting to, to indicate that we're heading into a, into a, in a, into a difficult area and that parents should be alerted to the fact that we, we may go back to uh, a virtual learning within, you know, a couple of days of notification of, of going over the threshold. Does, is that where you're heading, Mr. Schneider, with this, with your remarks? It is. And I think people need to be able to watch and plan and, and know what's going to happen the best they can. Obviously, this you know, as you've said many times, Mr. Tanner, the the whole, you know, flexibility is the name of the game this year. So what I want is a clear standard in place. And all I'm suggesting is we as a board say, yes, we're going to follow what the state and the county recommend. And it's, and it's not just one week where it tips over into 99 or, or 101. It takes two consecutive weeks of being in that substantial transmission phase. So, you know, it's it's not like you, you get a little bit and you get at least a week's notice, right? Because you get that first week in there and then, okay, everybody's on high alert. You know, this might be coming. And then you wait to see what the second week tells you. So, Would you say, sorry, go ahead. Snyder, that, that we're on high alert now? Well, it, 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 I mean, it's it's kind of like looking at the fire warning signs when you go into national parks right now. It's always, you know, fire danger is high, right? Um, so, but it's degrees of high right now, I think. So, you know, we're obviously all being very cautious right now. But I, I guess what I mean to say is that we should be on alert that the state and the county might be recommending that the school switch to virtual only learning, you know, and, and we can, and we'll know tomorrow morning if we're in a week, uh, we're in that first week where they're going to be saying, Hey, you should be thinking about a, a plan for transitioning to virtual learning. So uh, we, our next board meeting, we can hold a special meeting, of course, but our next scheduled board meeting isn't for a couple of weeks. Um, so my hope is that we could set the expectation now before we get there so that everybody knows and agrees what's going to happen. So... 
So is that is that a a uh, notification and plan that you want uh, Teresa to begin to to put to to ink, so to speak, so that we're ready to ready to go? Yeah, I think that's the next step after we, as a board, pick what those criteria are, um, because she can't. She, it's our decision whether or not the school is open or closed for virtual or hybrid learning. So without us spelling out what the criteria are for staying open or switching to virtual or switching back to hybrid, I think it's really hard administratively to communicate clearly with the community about what's going to happen. And I want to, in a time of, extreme uncertainty, I would like to give at least a little bit of advance notice about what, what our plan is. So now we have to get down to the difficult question of what what's, what's the criteria? Exactly. So, so I'm hoping that we can agree tonight on what that criteria is is before we are facing a situation where the county is recommending something and we're a couple of weeks behind the guidance because we haven't met yet. Um, and meanwhile, parents are calling the school and asking what's going to happen. The county is saying this, the state is saying this, tell me what's going to happen with my kid because I got to make plans. I might have to work from home. I might have to arrange for childcare. You know, I, there are just so many things that change when you when you make a switch like this and i just i want to be as clear as we can with the community about you know ahead of time this is the plan so but now i i think the, the email i sent said let's stick with the county criteria except for percent positivity let's keep it at seven percent like we had originally for reopening um you know I, i'm open to discussion on all of these um, but and in making it two consecutive weeks, like the state and the county are saying, uh, you know, either in or out. Oh, so we we made an arrangement to open the school. And, and I, I want to honor that arrangement so that so that it could be trusted again should we need to go out so that we could open the school again and we do what we say we were going to do. So I'm, I'm here to support the agreement that reopened the school. I think that's, that's where the integrity lies here in this situation. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I'm not trying to suggest we wouldn't honor that agreement no, sir, or keep that, that. Or, or keep that same criteria in place as, as the criteria for opening the school again if, if we have to switch to virtual. Um, but I think, you know, it's highly likely there's going to be a situation in the next within the next month where the state of Arizona and the Maricopa County are telling schools, you should switch to virtual learning. And what is our plan in that situation? What, what criteria are we going to factor? I think we can decide that tonight. Um, and what I'd like to also do is then what are the criteria for reopening so that we can watch the metrics, we can watch the guidance from the state and the county, and there's a plan in place for going virtual if certain criteria are met and reopening the school as soon as we possibly can um, when things go the other direction. Or hopefully, you know, just staying open because we never quite get into that threshold all the way. But where we are now is we've agreed to reopen the school, um, but we haven't agreed what are the criteria for if we would have to go virtual again or reopen it back up. So 
So I do. Mm, go ahead. Sorry, April. I just I it it makes sense to me to to I mean I'm I'm looking at the proposal that you sent out and it's what we agreed to initially um, in terms of the first portion of it when we would open. It just makes sense to me that we would continue with on that same thread and that same vein. And that's what you've done in this proposal. Um, I don't feel like it's, it doesn't change anything. It's just in, in writing and something that we, you know, can vote on. So like, like you said, just having a, a plan in place so that if we have to switch, we're ready to go. We already know what's expected and we can put this information out to the community as well. You know, you had mentioned that you're going to be contacting the community, giving more updates. Um, you know, information like this is helpful, like you said, for those who need to change their plans. If, they, if they've got all of their kids at school right now and then the benchmarks change, having a plan in place and that parent being able to, to go look it up, you know, on Parent Square or wherever and say, OK, this is what the board said. This is what the plan is. They can make plans. They're not scrambling, which also helps us and the school helps the entire community because we're not, you know, going back on what's the criteria. This wasn't clear, blah, 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 blah. It's all up front. It's all in writing. We're ready to go. We have a plan. I'm happy with it. It's exactly what we decided on to begin with. So it works for me. So, thank you, April. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, Mr. Tanner, let me ask you this then. Are there specific criteria that you would change in, in the proposal I've made, or would you do something totally different? I, I I agree with your proposal, but uh, okay. I'll stand by that. Okay. Nathaniel, did you have something you wanted to add? I, it, it seems to me that one exercise that was very helpful for us in making the decision in the first place was some um, questionnaire work with those who are actually impacted by this construct. And so it's teachers, you know, there's significant implications to their day to day. I don't, I don't see transitioning between virtual and hybrid. I don't see it fluidly. I, we've experienced that already that it isn't fluid. It's a very clunky thing. So we're talking about it like we're zooming in and out based on a criteria and then zooming back in. And I just, it's way more complex than than uh, than three data points, you know, as far as I'm concerned. So I, I just if there was a mechanism that we could get some more consensus, I assume, however, that it'll be split like it's been, you know, historically on on the set of issues. So I, maybe it's not helpful, but it's, uh, you know, obviously parents are affected. And you're right. They, they have a, a right. To, to know as early as possible. Um, the state seems to think that two weeks notice is enough notice um, because that's what we're dealing with retroactively is a two week window. Um, I feel like what you're saying is you'd like to know much earlier than that potentially if we're just following a certain set of guidelines to decide whether today we're open and tomorrow we're closed or vice versa. Um, I just don't, obviously a forced choice, you know, when we see it change and the guidance changes, that is material at the table and it's substantive and we'd have to make a choice. Um, but planning for something that is difficult to plan for, I, you know, I just, I don't disagree with any of the criteria or any of the sentiment that's been discussed. I'm not you know, just trying to be difficult um, for no reason. I There would be serious implications no matter what. So um, I think to your point, hopefully it doesn't change, but I think in, this, in the event that it does, for sure having criteria set up would be helpful, you know, 
I'm undecided at this stage as to whether or not the same three line items that, you know, potentially moved us forward should be the thing to move us back. I agree with the logic of integrity that it makes sense. So, it, it, you know, it, I just want to think about it. You know, that I think your proposal was pretty recent. And I just think we need some time really to, to consider all of the implications both ways to do what's best for the community. Um, you can tell I do hesitate about aggregated data, whether or not it's representative of our individual community. You know, it's, I don't want to undervalue all of the hard work and discipline that has gone in, you know, to every day since we opened. And is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, but it's, I, from from the looks of things, everybody is going way beyond, you know, just to ensure that our mitigated mitigation strategies and all of that are in place. And it's something that's less representative than what we're actually experiencing day to day being the decision maker. I just don't know if that's, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right way to think about it at this stage. So. COVID's taught us that nothing is predictable, right? Nothing is planable. So I, and that may be a blanket statement that I'm not prepared to defend, but I, uh. <laughs> All right. Well, the, I, I hear what you're saying about w wanting to build more consens consensus and think about it more, but it, it, I would guess we'll just have to agree to disagree on that one, Nathaniel. Um, so at this point, let me stop screen share. Um, I will make a motion if I can find the right verbiage. Okay. So I will move that Desert Marigold School will remain open or reopen using its current hybrid learning model as long as using, from, using data from the Arizona Department of Health Services for Maricopa County School benchmarks. All of the following factors are met for two consecutive weeks. One, cases for 100,000 people remains below 100. Two, percent positivity remains below 7%. And three hospital visits for COVID like illnesses remain below 10%. And second part of the same motion, uh, Desert Marigold School will transition as quickly as feasible to virtual learning with on site support services for eligible students using data from Arizona Department of Health Services for Maricopa County School benchmarks when any of the following factors are met for two consecutive weeks. One, cases per 100,000 people remains above 100. Two, percent positivity remains above 7%. Or three, hospital visits for COVID-like illnesses remains above 10%. I'll second. Thank you, April. Any further discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? All right, motion carries. And please Thank send you me that, all Gregory. For, uh, yeah, <laughs> There's no I way I caught all that. <laughs> Thanks. Yep, yeah, I, I'll send it to you. and. and I just want to thank all of you for your candid discussion and uh, deep thinking that's gone into this issue. Uh, it's much appreciated. All right. Um, next up, we have budget and finance. Uh, so we have uh, update on RSF negotiations. So good news, just this afternoon, RSF has approved the extension of our loan. Uh, so now we're just at a point of 
um, filling out the paperwork. All right, so that's that's great news. Uh, that's going to uh, extend uh, the loan out for another 18 months, I believe, and then reduce our payment uh, that's required to be made by about $5,000 a month, I think. Uh, so that helps us from a cash flow perspective. And then uh, one of the requirements is that we also take that $5,000 that we're not paying them and keep it as a cash uh, reservoir for the school. So they're helping us build up our rainy day fund. So that's, that's all good news. Um, the enrollment update, um, let's see, let me pull up the spreadsheet. All right, so it looks like if I'm reading this correctly for November, um, we're currently sitting at 277 enrollment. Does that, Teresa, I don't know if you've looked at these numbers recently. Does that sound right? I looked at them the other day with Crystal. It sounds in the range. I'm sorry, but to a to an exact number, I don't know yet. I'm sorry. No, no, that's that's okay. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, all right, but but yeah, I, I think we're holding there, and then uh, so it, it goes up and down by one or two. It seems like. Um, but it's holding in the 270s, which is good. Um, the, also good news, um, the last time we met, uh, there was a discussion about the equalization payment from the state and uh, Priscilla, our, our, who works for Aspire, our outside accountant, was predicting that our equalization payment was going to go down from, I think it was about 229 to 189. Um, but we actually got it uh, in a, a couple of days ago, and it, the state paid it out at two hundred twelve thousand uh, for the month, so significantly higher than we were thinking. So that's another great news financially for the school. All right. Um, any other financial matters we need to discuss right now, board members? Okay, sure. Uh, Teresa, anything from your perspective? Nope. Okay. Um, all right. So let's move on to the executive director search. Um, and I'll just turn this over to April and Nathaniel to tell us where we are and sifting through over 100 applications for the position. April, do you want to just take us through kind of what we've done so far? Sure. Um, we have had two meetings already with the advisory panel. Um, we, we've covered a lot of territory in those two meetings. Um, but most importantly, we've whittled down our applicants from over 100 to 25. Um, and our next meeting, we will be um, deciding from those 25 which to interview. Um, and we all are also working on um, our scoring sheet and interview questions, um, figuring out the type of documentation that we want to send over to the board to keep everyone um, informed of what's happening. What else am I missing, Nathaniel? Lots of really cool people on the advisory panel. It's fun. It's been fun. I think that's a good summary. You know, we, we'd like to be able to recommend I think three to five for actual board interview and, you know, board review and all of that. And obviously give access to the board for any of the potential candidates beyond that. You know, if, if for whatever reason out of the three to five, there isn't one that's ultimately uh, decided upon and, and offer extended. So um, we're just trying to be thoughtful and thorough and, you know, all of that. So, but it's going well. I think. Our next meeting is Friday, so we're trying to work quickly. 
Excellent. That's great news. Uh, I mean, that's pulling it down to 25. I think that's, that's tremendous progress very quickly. So my commendation to both of you and to the whole advisory panel. Thanks for your hard work. That's great news. Okay. All right. So that takes us to our board procedures. Um, the first step is a discussion or approval of minutes of our previous meetings. Um, so our last meeting was on October 23rd. Uh, there are two sets of minutes, both regular and executive session. Is that right, April? I don't think that date is right. Okay. I want to say it's the 21st. Yeah, it was the 21st. Sorry, that's why I was giving weird looks. Uh, <laughs> the 21st. I, 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 I could see the wheels turning and I knew I had done something wrong. Okay, so October 21st. Um, all right, so I'm actually the one who drafted those. So if somebody else wants to move to um, approve them, I'd appreciate it. Otherwise, I'll do it. I don't think it's a true conflict. Go ahead, April. Okay. Uh, Gregory, do I do them both at once or separately? You can do them as a group. Yep. Okay. So I, I move that we approve the minutes uh, for both the public and the executive session from the meeting on October 21st. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Let's make this easy. It's unanimous, the motion carries. All right. Which takes us to uh, April. Anything on our calendar uh, coming up that we need to know about? No, not anything extra, just same old, same old meetings and interviews and whatnot. Um, I have a, uh, I'm meeting with someone, uh, a consultant that uh, the Alliance uh, has recommended as a potential candidate to participate in a, the community contemplation exercise we've discussed. Um, so it, making some progress there, um, but going kind of slow and trying to pace it with the search for the executive director. But um, I, I'd like to start building that toolbox so we're ready. So having that discussion on Friday, uh, I'll let you know how it goes. Um, all right. So I put on here discussing reinstating public comments and also a discussion of holding regular town halls. Because um, I think one of the things we've heard from the community is that they would like more communication and more access uh, to people with information. And it, it strikes, there's some merit to offering public comments at, at the board setting because it lets us hear from people uh, in a public way and, and they can voice their uh, praise or their dissatisfaction. Um, and I think there's merit to having that done publicly and letting others in the community hear it. Um, at the same time, I, I think a, a town hall discussion format might be better served for many of the questions and comments that come up at board meetings from members of the public. And uh, we're somewhat limited in our board meetings because we can allow public comments, but and we can respond to criticism, uh, but we otherwise can't really discuss some, any of the issues that are brought up or, um, you know, have any kind of dialogue, which I think is what really needs to happen. So my thought is I'd like to start scheduling um, town hall meetings um, sometime on the weekend, probably, uh, you know, just set it for an hour and invite um, a board member 
somebody from the faculty, somebody from the administration uh, to come and answer questions. Uh, just an open forum, uh, try and keep it friendly and try and get information. And if we don't have it, then we would try and get it and, and share that information. Um, because I, I think what we've been missing for a long time as a community is a, 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 a dialogue about what are what are your concerns? Obviously, we know some of the big ones we're all concerned about COVID. Um, but there, there are a lot of nuances and there's not um, been a lot of opportunity in almost eight months to have an interaction with other people who are dealing uh, with the same things you are in a school-sponsored event. Uh, so I'm thinking that's where we would get the most value is having that kind of public forum discussion town hall with some folks from the board and faculty and admin. Um, but before I start trying to implement that, I just wanted to hear board members, it, it, would you be interested in that? Are you available for something like that? Um, do you think it would be helpful? Do you think we should skip that and do just public comment? Um, I'm definitely open to town hall discussions. I feel like um, as someone who often came to board meetings and shared a public comment, I would also um, share an email with the board, usually a letter with a lot of detail because we were only allowed so many minutes to have a public comment. Um, and I always, if I needed some sort of follow-up, I would have to schedule a meeting anyway to have the discussion, to, to talk about the concern, to solve the problem, whatever. Um, and I think I would have appreciated a, a town hall, such as you're discussing, to be able to go and talk to somebody, you know, at, at a ready date. You know, there's something comforting in, um, you know, if these would be held once a month or whatever, knowing, okay, in three weeks, in two weeks, I can go to the board, I can ask them this question in an open environment and a teacher could help or whatever. Um, I think that's helpful. I think those discussions are important. Um, and of course, we always have our email. People can reach us that way and they can talk to administration. Um, I don't think there's any issue with opening another avenue of, of communication. Thanks, April. Other thoughts? Nothing doing. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'll, I'm going to continue to explore that and think about scheduling and, and who might be available for it. Um, I, I'm happy to show up and answer questions for an hour uh, a couple times a month. It, it, as a representative of the board, um, I, I think it's important to have that dialogue with the community. Um, all right. So I've, the next thing on here, unless there's anything else, um, is uh, discussion and action on any needed steps for regulatory compliance uh, with AD and with the charter board. Uh, so what prompted this item on our agenda is uh, we got an, we attempted over, over a month ago now to update the board members with the Arizona Charter Board um, saying this is who's on the board, this is who's left the board, um, and here are the minutes showing that. And um, they came back really confused saying it seems like essentially – there, we, we're finding people on here where we don't have a record of them. And it, basically what happened is it just has been too long, um, has too much time has passed in giving them regular updates about our changing composition as a board. So they're really confused. Uh, so I'm, uh, I, I reached out to them. I'm having uh, a meeting with one of their more senior folks to try and figure out a plan for, what exactly we need to correct. Um, but one of the things that they've pointed out is that if you are having a meeting 
in person, you need to list the physical address of the meeting in, in the meeting minutes. And what we have done in the past is say, you know, the Eurythmy Room on Desert Marigold campus or the English uh, Room on the high school at Desert Marigold. Uh, apparently that's not sufficient. Uh, so the fix is simply uh, to do that moving forward, of course. Um, but I think uh, we can also make a general motion uh, tonight to amend all prior minutes to add the physical address if one applies to that meeting. Um, all right, so not hearing any thoughts on that one. So I, I'm going to move that we amend uh, the minutes for, we'll call it the last three years to include the physical address for all board meetings held in person on Desert Marigold campus. I'll second, I'll second that. All right. Any further discussion? All right. Excuse me. Give April a second to catch up. Uh, all right. All those in favor? Unanimous motion passes. Um, and then the other thing is that they pointed out in the minutes from November 20th, 2019, uh, it shows that we voted on uh, new board members, uh, including April, but there was not actually, uh, no one made a motion to take the vote or to accept the results of the vote, uh, which is a pretty technical nitpicky thing, but that's how they're reading it. Um, so to fix that, I think we just need to move to accept the results of the board member votes uh, that were taken on November 20th, 2019, as reflected in the minutes. Um, so I'll make that motion now. So I move to accept the votes uh, taken for new board members during the November 29th, 20, uh, November 20th, 2019 meeting as reflected in the minutes of that meeting. I'll second that. Thanks, Nathaniel. Any further discussion? All those in favor? And it's unanimous. Sorry if I jumped the gun there, April. I surprisingly followed that one. I'm very proud of myself right now. I'm getting it done. Mm -hmm. Not following a lot. Well <laughs> the words are getting on the page. <laughs> um, all right. Which brings us to our last item of the evening, believe it or not. Um, right on time, I think, at 7.30. Um, interviews with our board member applicants. So we have uh, three uh, board member applicants. Uh, I'm really excited about all of them. I think they have a lot to offer. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, more from them to a set series of questions. So um, board member applicants, um, please feel free to turn on your cameras. Perfect. Good to see you all. Thank you for being here. Um, thanks for sitting through many meetings and caring so much about the school. I uh, appreciate it already. Um, so we're going to roll through 12 questions. Um, I'm going to give you each a minute to answer each one, and then we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, and I'm doing that both in the interest of time and fairness, so everybody has the same amount of time on the floor uh, to tell us about themselves. All right, let me find the questions, which April I have shared. Here we go, okay. So I'll kick it off and then I'll pass the baton on to uh, the other board members. Um, so let's start with 
Uh, Danielle Martinez, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, again, thank you for having me. My name is Danielle Martinez. We've been a part of Desert Marigold Schools since 2010. My daughter attended the private preschool program and I toured many schools and knew as soon as I stepped foot on campus, that was the journey I wanted our family to embark on. Uh, Rudolf Steiner and the Waldorf curriculum was very new to our family, so I dove in, did as much research and participation as I could to find out how I could bring the breadth of the school into our home life. I'm a banker for Chase. I've been in my role 23 years. I really enjoy what I do. I'm, my schedule is a bit flexible, especially when I work a Saturday, I'll have a day off during the week, so if I'm at my availability will be accommodating to what's needed. I'm re really a positive attitude, really enjoy working with the school and the community that I've learned to um, participate in and be around the school so much. I mean, I went to every play, every graduation, every ACWI meeting, everything with school sponsored, parent education meetings, orientation, school tours, um, really did enjoy and appreciate what the school had to offer to my daughter and our community and our family. Perfect. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, Dan. Sure. Um, I have been, this is our fourth year at the school. We have three kids there. Uh, discovered the school, basically looking at the biodynamic nature of the gardening and all that, and also the emotional support. Really thought that was fantastic. Um, kids have enjoyed it. We've also been involved with all the events. Increasingly so as time has passed, and uh, it's kind of addictive. The getting the involvement with all the different people and the community has been fantastic. Um, I've worked in leadership roles, uh, at Ticketmaster, Live Nation, doing IT stuff for about 15 to 16, I think 17 years now. So I've, um, I have a lot of experience with managing teams and uh, teamwork and team building and just kind of uh, just working through difficult things and helping people. And I had time and thought that my skill set would be useful. So. Perfect. Thank you. And Lee, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So um, I was involved in Rudolf Steiner many, many years ago. My son is now 44. <laughs> He was a, in the Waldorf schools uh, in Minneapolis, first uh, grade through fourth, and then when we moved to Maui, he was in the school, in the school there. When I came to Arizona, because I spent 20 years at, on the East Coast um, directing leadership institutes for Cornell University and a national uh, leadership institute, and then for the State University of New York, and we worked with administrators and teachers and um, faculty and students. And then we, I traveled to different parts of the world to study leadership with indigenous cultures and also um, sac sacred sites. And when I moved to uh, Arizona, I'm up in uh, Flagstaff. Uh, there's a lady here named Terry who was asked to be on the board. And she spoke to me and she goes, you know, you've had so much information and uh, experience with Waldorf. Why don't you see if you could, would you have an interest of being on the board? And so I spoke to your last uh, director of your board for quite a while, and I've spoken to April to get more information, and uh, I really miss Waldorf. And so when I went down to Phoenix, I actually looked at your campus, and I walked around and saw the different things, and I was so impressed with um, <clears throat> just all of the... Um, opportunities that you have for students that have nothing to do with what the regular schools have, going to classroom and classroom. And I love the idea of um, students making their own um, books and in interacting with the full range of things. And I don't know if your students are involved with uh, meals, but they have a garden, they can make meals, they can deliver. So it's, it's just the whole full breadth of what it's like to be involved in this in the school, and so I'm interested in um, 
managing a project, helping to determine strategic uh, goals for it and find out where there are places that you have to do something else. And also really developing leadership, self-leadership and team leadership for uh, the people that work at uh, the school. So that's all I have to say. I can't hear you. I was muted. <laughs> Did it to myself. Um, uh, thank you, Lee. All right. Uh, Nathaniel, do you want to ask the next question on the list? Gregory, do, do you have a list of questions or is this of my own making? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's one I circulated um, earlier. It's uh, also in the... Um, folder that April uh, sent out just before the meeting today. What made you interested in joining the board? Question number two. Y yes. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll let... No, no, that's my question. <laughs> I'm saying I've po I'm now posing it. <laughs> I'm going to go in reverse order. I'm taking ownership of this question. So let's, uh, let's start with, uh, with Dan. Um, I was interested in joining the board uh, just because I saw that so few people were doing so much work and I was like, man, I was like, like I kept wanting to be critical, but then realizing it's like, how can, so like if everyone's not getting involved, how can they're like, you, you're, this isn't your full-time job, obviously. So I, I saw that help was needed. And I saw this like last year and I just kind of started really thinking about it. And then I kind of thought about what my skill sets were, which are obviously very IT oriented, but I also know a lot about like about dynamic gardening. And I'm very interested in like a lot of the Waldorf concepts and uh, the head, heart, hands or head, yeah, head, heart, hands stuff. And all the, all the different concepts that I've been like really learning a whole lot about these last few years. And it just kind of made sense me to at least see if you all wanted my help. Lee, can I have you answer the same question that I came up with, obviously? <laughs> sure, it's a good question. Congratulations. <laughs> um, I really believe in Rudolf Steiner and the Waldorf, and I'm a dietitian and herbalist, so I've studied a lot about herbs and uh, the uh, the medicines or the, the food that Waldorf uses. And I really believe that, and there's only one school in Arizona for Waldorf. And I thought, I really want to help to bring young leaders into the world that are really involved in the world, that really can um, make a difference, that um, can bring, bring into the world the values that Rudolf Steiner has. And so, um, and I, I, I too saw how overwhelmed you guys are. And I found that maybe with some of the skill set I have and the experience, I could help to, to build and create a Waldorf community. Thanks, Lee. Yep. And yeah. <laughs> I've served in many roles at the school and I've always thought about the board and I attended many, many board meetings. And so I chaired parent council first when my daughter was younger, feeling like I wouldn't be pulled in too many directions. And it just seems like the timing in my life is where I can dedicate a lot more time to be an active board member. And it definitely seeing how few um, to be able to spread out the workload to have a, a nice focus on an area that you would like to dedicate more time and effort to. And it, it seems that it is you're spread out so thin and I would like to be helpful in that area. Thank you. Mr. Tanner, do you want to walk us through the next one? Sure. This question uh, it has been answered, but for sake of consistency, I'll, uh, I'll give the question. What skills do you have that you think will fit and serve the school as a board mm -hmm. member? And uh, why don't we go to... to um, Dan Franks, please. Sure. Um, I, I believe that I'm good at organizing things. I think it's important to 
when you have the set of information before you be able to analyze it and ask the right questions around that information to know how to determine what direction one should go in. Um, I do think I'm particularly skilled at that. I'm also good at interviewing people and kind of I've hired so many people and I can't remember the one bad hire you know, over the entire time. So I, I think that'd be hopefully helpful if it's if, it, if there's time for the executive director or any other engineering type of roles. I just have a lot of like kind of organizational experience that I think would probably be applicable. That's it. Thank you. Uh, what about uh, Danielle, please? Mr. Tanner, just so you know, Jamie Diamond already signed off on it. We're good to go. That's good. That's good with me then. Well, I'm dedicated. I'm authentic. I'm sincere. I work well with others. I love public speaking. I worked with rewriting our bylaws. You may or may not know our school was started by parents. So parents were the teachers and were the board members. So we didn't have a lot of policies in place. Um, work well with others. I've had leadership training. I've had a direct role in hiring, interviewing, and training through work. Um, I completed my foundation studies, which is some of the groundwork of you know, a teacher would embark into the Waldorf certification. I participated in the Parzival meditations. I've witnessed the mystery dramas. I feel like everything that I've been able to do for my personal growth, I can bring into working with others and making sure that we can expand true to our mission and being able to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Leave the same question, please. Can I just say ditto? <laughs> She's covered everything. I'm not, I don't, no, I'm not. I just I wanted to throw that in. So as director of a National Leadership Institute, I've had many different hats. Finance, uh, HR. Um, I've done a lot of presentations. <clears throat> I've actually put together a lot of different workshops and panels. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I've uh, written a lot of articles. Um, I have a lot of certifications in emotional intelligence and strength quest and different things like that. And I think the most important thing is that I'm a really good listener. I listen to people. Um, I interject when I feel it's appropriate. And I'm really a team player. I really enjoy being with people and not having like the role, but, but all of us working together to create something that's great. So I think that's it. And I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent now. <laughs> Thank you. And April, I think you're up. In your opinion, what is the biggest concern facing DMS right now? And let's start with Danielle. Uh, in my opinion, I would say uh, is student enrollment. And from reading the paperwork you sent us with the long range plan, and I quote, the most significant accessible immediate source of additional income. So I would think that would be my opinion, the biggest concern. Uh, the stability of our finances, it was huge to open us to other resources to really focus on the priorities for the school. <clears throat> um, and then the uh, director position, but in my opinion, enrollment. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Lee. I think communication is the biggest uh, hurdle right now. Communication between teachers, between students, between um, uh, parents, and also the community. I think that you can go from the individual to the classroom, to the school, to the community, and then to the wider wider uh, community uh, nation. And so I also think um, communicating who we are and what we do to the community is really, really important so that people have a better, <clears throat> so we're much more, um, not separated, but more un un unified in what we want to do and what we're doing. I would agree around communication. Um, I think we've done 
a lot better this year, or this summer specifically, as far as the board has. Like I, I used to be kind of super frustrated that I didn't feel like I could figure out what was going on ever at the school. But I think like over the summer and the COVID stuff, and even even earlier in the year before all that stuff happened, I thought that the board was doing a lot better at communication, but I still think it's an opportunity to improve. And to what Lee was saying, communicating with getting our our what Waldorf or and Desert Marigold is out to the community will help. I feel drive increased enrollment in the higher grades. I think that people just don't know how awesome it is. And if they could get more insight into that somehow, it would really drive that enrollment and uh, push the school forward helping out with finances and, and whatnot. Can I say one more thing? Uh, going on that, what you just said, um, also maybe doing some uh, videos that we would put online or that we could circulate because it's great to talk about something, but when you can actually see it, mm -hmm. it really pulls you in and you can really uh, get a feel for what it's doing. And it could be videos with students, teachers, parents, some of the community members. So all the different constituents that you can think of that would want to watch this video, it could be one video, but it could cover a lot of different things. That's, I think, a great idea. Um, that we'd all like to see happen. Um, all right, which brings us to our next question. Uh, in your opinion, what is going well at PMS right now? Uh, let's start with Lee this time. Well, I don't know much about your school, so I don't know how I can answer that well. Um, Just listening to the board meetings, because I've been to three of them now, uh, the way that you ask a question and then get guidance from each other and then take a vote. I mean, I like that idea of it's not just one person trying to figure it out. So um, otherwise, I don't know what goes on in your school, so I can't really answer that correctly. Fair enough. Uh, Danielle. I would like to express, thank you. <laughs> I would like to express my gratitude to the teachers um, for rolling out this hybrid model, whether they're remote or in person or both. You know, I, that's definitely a daunting demand and I volunteered quite a bit in the classroom, so I can't even imagine what that may be like for them. So I, I think that's going well. My daughter is super excited to be back in person. I've seen exponential growth since she's been back in the classroom with her work, her happiness and her studies. So that is definitely going well. Thank you. And of course, everyone else who's behind the scenes helping that to, to happen. Perfect, thanks. And Dan? I would agree on the, uh, I would say two things, like how the board and the former ED handled the COVID response was really impressive and a lot better than a lot of public schools that I saw and, and was interacting with pretty directly through my siblings and their kids in their schools. Um, we did a really top-notch job, so that was impressive. And then I also the teachers, like the kids, like our kids, so last time we talked, our kids hadn't really gone back yet, and they have since, and the teachers are just handling it so well. Uh, even even though we're having troubles with our fourth grade teachers and, you know, keeping the retention there and stuff, that's obviously a pain point. But that being said, it's still, uh, I'm really impressed with how everything's being handled and how how loved the kids feel. They don't, they don't feel any of this drama that, this, that the parents worry about with teachers and stuff. They're, they're feeling well taken care of and they're having a really good time with their friends and learning. So good job. All right, Nathaniel, if you wanna take us to question six. Yeah, this is the self-indulgent question. What, uh, what has the board done right in the past year? And we'll start with uh, reverse order. We'll start with Dan. I'm just going to go back to communication. That was my main complaint, like uh, in, in the prior years, was that I felt like it was hard to figure out what was going on, and I think that communications has been really ramped up. Um, and then uh, I think also being honest and direct with the community has been uh, not that you, not that the board wasn't before. It's that they've been. I think it feels like the, there's been an increased focus on trying to make sure that the way communications are made are don't leave as much up for question so that people 
interpret what you're trying to say accurately, I think is what I feel the board's gotten a lot better at doing. Thanks. And Lee? <laughs> I have a disadvantage is that I don't have a child in your school right now. And I'm fairly new to the West Coast. Um, but I think what I'm, what I think the board does well in the limited time I've had is the way that you discuss issues and come up with solutions and then, but are really open to how they're going to change or, or, or all the different uh, areas that are involved in that decision. So it's not like, okay, this is happening. We're going to do this. It's like, we're looking at, and we're getting parents input and teachers input. And so what you're doing is you're really looking at the whole scope of what's going on. Thanks. And Danielle. I was extremely impressed with how prompt uh, the board was able to convene after the resignation of the board. It was very impressive that you all came together to delegate, to make decisions promptly and effectively. It was, um, I was very impressed. It was a proud moment. It was very nice to see that, again, all working together and, and moving forward without hesitation and inviting the advisory board to include so many of the parents, faculty, and board. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tanner, uh, would you like to take us to question seven? Uh, let's, go to, let's go to Lee. What could the board do better or do differently, please? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What could the board do better or differently? <sighs> I don't know if you have certain committees or people that work on a project together, because I think that really widens um, the ideas that people have and the support that people have. So um, that's the one thing that I would say, but I don't know if you're doing that or not. Or not. Thank you. Uh, let's go to uh, Danielle. Same question, please. I would recommend having more members. Um, that way you have adequate resources to be able to focus on the areas that you want to. I would like to see um, maybe have more of what the vision really is for each of you on how you're working together or what the vision of the school would be. I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Um, so maybe communicating that. Um, going for outside pockets and fundraising. I'm a part of a few other organizations that have a really sound model for doing that. And so that would be nice to to incorporate That's all I would recommend. And of course, having me on the board. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Well, let's finish up with, uh, with Dan, please. Um, I, I would say that so it's all based on like the level of resources. So increasing the board size will help, but pairing up on projects to make them more enjoyable and make it not so yep. laborious for individual board members. Um, I agree on that and totally think that uh, I'm not sure if th this could be something you've already looked into, but like maybe grant writing, like having s someone who's spending a certain amount of dedicated time looking for grants for the school to generate money that way as well. Um, I know that's time, time intensive, another time intensive thing. Yeah, yeah. Once again, only so much time, but uh, yeah, those, those things. Thank you. And April, when you're ready, if you want to take us to question eight, please. What is your availability for time commitment to the board? And let's start with Dan. So on a fairly regular average basis, I'd say like two to three hours a week. Um, I do tend to be able to be fairly bursty with my workload. Uh, work, I work from home. I can time shift a lot. Uh, I do have a lot of meetings, but in general, like I can throw in some weekend time and, and do do larger chunks of time when, when necessary as well. Yeah, 
And Danielle? Whatever it takes. I am committed as long as I'm available with uh, outside of work hours before. Again, I have a day off during the week if I have a Saturday shift and evenings. Emily? I'm retired <laughs> and I'm doing a lot of volunteer work. Um, and my schedule is pretty open. Um, so I would say five to 10 hours a week. And if, probably depending on what project we're working on, it might take more time, it might take less time. So I'm pretty flexible as far as how much time it would take. Sure, thank you. All right. Uh, question number nine, if selected as a board member, uh, what committees or projects would you like to focus on in your first year? Uh, I think each of you has touched on this a little bit, but here's the question I asked directly. Uh, let's start this time uh, with Danielle. Uh, I love public speaking, so I would love to go with the marketing efforts, fundraising efforts. I would like to visit schools and do presentations about our high school or middle school. I'd like to record virtual tours if the school's open to that, having people see, again, the wonderful things that our children and, and the faculty are capable of. It would be nice to incorporate that if we want it to be virtual or in person, just to have that as a, whether it's social media or, or um, an, an online course that we can share the talents of everything we have to offer. Um, the mentoring part, um, board training. So whatever, whatever I'm asked to do, I will see the heart to any task. Thanks. And Lee, let's turn to you. Um, I'm interested in both internal, internal and external. I would love to go out, in, out into the community and get, and get to know them. I've done workshops, I've done presentations, I've done um, con conferences, just to let them know who we are and really reach out and uh, get a more uh, personal uh, thing. I also would like to work internally with, uh, as I mentioned before, helping um, faculty and students, maybe faculty, to really look at what are they passionate about? What is it that they wanna bring to, how do they wanna serve the world and help them to uh, figure out how that is and how they play that role in uh, in the school. Thank you. And Dan? Yeah. Oh, I think to what Danielle was saying about the community engagement and marketing and stuff like, like, like that, I'm not as uh, great at the public speaking portion, but I am highly knowledgeable about the online representation side of things like SEO and um, all that fun. And, and really, I could, if, if it was something that people decided they wanted me to spend my time on, I could definitely carve off a project to work with Danielle to definitely uh, boost the, the school's image online. And uh, that's something that'd be fairly in my wheelhouse if that was something that we wanted to. But mostly, I think, I think overall, it's hard to know what where we'd be most helpful without being more involved in the first place. So it's kind of like once you see the lay of the land and, and are on the meetings regularly and, and and kind of talking to everybody about what's going on and where where help is needed, it's hard to know where I would be best fit. I guess um, so. I want to help wherever I can, honestly. But I have some random ideas that you might have all said that thought through already, but like, ah, not right now. It's not, it doesn't fit us or whatever. But just want to help. Thanks. And I'll turn it over to Nathaniel for question 10. All right. Mine's a hard question. <laughs> I know Gregory has a conflict of interest with me. Just kidding. But do you have any perceived conflicts of interest that would compromise your ability to serve as a board member? And we'll start with uh, Lee. Hmm. And until I know the school better and uh, what you're doing, um, I can't think of anything right now. 
Great. And uh, Danielle? I don't anticipate any conflict of interest, but when it comes to banking, I would only be able to answer general questions. I would not be able to advise for um, investment purposes or any guidance, but I could refer to another partner on my team. Great. And Dan? I cannot get people free tickets, no matter how many times they ask. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> but I'm a great volunteer. Uh, I have kids at school, so I could see that potentially there would be a conflict of interest there where I might make some decision potentially or that could be biased towards them in some way, but I don't, uh, I wouldn't let myself do that. I'd look up for the school. Thank you. Right, Gregory, they've been vetted. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nathaniel. And, uh, Conflicts of opinion and ideas at times, but but not oh. with you personally. <laughs> uh, all right, Mr. Tanner, can you take us to number 11, please? Number 11, can you see yourself working well with all board, board members? So let's do, go to Dan, please. Um, in short, yes. I have worked with a lot of this board's full of people that are pretty socially adept in my field of study. There's a, a large contingent of people who are not necessarily very good with other people and are very brash. Uh, I'm really good at understanding what people uh, like empathizing with where they're coming from and what they're saying and hearing it versus sometimes tone can be a little ab abrupt from people. <clears throat> and so I'm good at, dealing with people from all different walks and types and personalities. So I think it'd be fine. Great. Anyway. Thank you. Um, Lee, what, how, how about you, please? Well, I've worked a lot with diverse people traveling around the world and also with the different colleges that I worked with. And um, I've been ex exposed to a lot of different opinions on certain subjects. And so um, I'm open to that. I'm not always agreeable with what people say, but I'm open to talking about it and really looking at it in a different way, maybe putting a little twist to it or expanding what that means. Um, and I, from what I've seen on the board, it seems like um, that would be welcome there. I think you froze. Yeah. I, or he just are you still with us? Or he's still staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it uh, looks like you dropped off. But D Danielle, why don't you go ahead and give us your answer and we'll just keep moving. Um, yes, I do work well with others. Um, I love people. I love that interaction. That's my favorite part of my job is dealing with strangers and helping them meet their financial goals. And I do need to get to know them. I have to be listening as much, much more than talking. So it's, it's a treat to be able to work with all walks of life. And I really enjoy that part of it. So yes. Perfect. Thank you. And April, uh, with the last question, if you would, please. What questions do you have for us? Are you calling? Go on for us? it. No, someone be brave. Speak out. I, like, I thought you I thought you said you only wanted to go to two hours. Um, I have a few questions, but they don't all have to be answered right now. But um, what committees what committees currently exist? Because you had asked on what projects we wanted to work on. I did look at the documents, but I wanted to know if that's all active. Um, how do you feel about board members who vote on board members? I don't think that's typical with other organizations. Usually it's voted on by the community. Um, and what are the skill sets that you're looking for? Have you evaluated what you already have to offer and what you would like to see on the board? And how can the parent body be more supportive or engaged being that we are remote? Do you want me to repeat that? 
<laughs> that, that, Should that, I email this you, yesterday? You, you came ready. Uh, <laughs> So uh, let me touch on some of those. I don't know if I'll hit all of them. Um, the, what committees do we have? We, we, Because of the open meeting law, that we have a formal committee, then we have to follow the committee itself has to follow the open meeting laws and those notices and, and that sort of thing. Um, but we, so we, We've had those in the past. We don't currently have any official committees, but we do have working groups um, on certain issues. So like this advisory panel uh, that we've put together is essentially a working group of a less than a quorum of board members uh, who's working on that. Um, John Elling and I have been working on uh, RSS issues. Um, we, for a while, had uh, I was working with Mr. Tanner on some site issues and, and planning on that. Um, got overwhelmed by COVID and ha haven't really turned back to that yet. The let's see, you also asked, um, how, how do I feel about uh, a board that votes its own members on that versus them being elected by the community? Uh, you know, it has its pros and cons. Uh, pros are ideally you get, um, some institutional longevity, I think, in, in that. And then you have kind of a set group of leaders who are picking the future leadership, uh, at least at the board level and, and can be consistent on the plan and the execution for the school. Uh, the, the downside, I think, especially in a volunteer board setting, is that you you can have high turnover, like we've had recently, uh, which means that you're not getting the benefits of that long-term vision of, of people, you know, selecting their successors essentially and, and passing the baton of a consistent, coherent plan. Um, I, I don't know that, um, you know, the, a po as the last couple of days have revealed, a popular vote certainly has strong merits, um, <laughs> uh, no, no matter your walk of life. Um, I, I, I don't know if that necessarily makes sense in this school community. Um, People are certainly very vocal about their opinions. I think some more than others. Um, I don't know. It, I, I, it'd be interesting to see shifting to that, but I, I think it would take kind of a dramatic shift was, organizationally. Wasn't recommending. I just wanted to know what your views were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then I know you had other questions, but I'm going to let other board members talk. Um, and the other was, what skill set would you like to have or see on the board for what you already have? And of course, feel free, any, any one of you. So I am personally looking for people who um, are going to initiate and, you know, jump with both feet in immediately and just throw out ideas. Um, it's easy to get very overwhelmed with all of the things that are happening. And so I think... Um, New people helps us. Fresh ideas help us. Um, and so, yeah, the, the skill set I'm looking for is someone who's a go-getter and who has ideas and is ready to, to work and, and help in any capacity possible, whether it's um, by leading something or by following something and supporting someone. Um, I think that's a huge skill set that will benefit us. Um. I want. I wanted to speak just quickly to to the the second question that you had that Gregory talked about um, board members voting on board members. Um, the only point I'd want to add is that as board members, we're privy to private information, um, and sometimes that is really um, important when deciding, you know, who you're going to vote for to be on the on the board. Um, and as Gregory said, you know, our, our community is vocal. They lend their support. They also lend their, their, um, 
you know, negative opinions as well. But often the information we get from the community is just that it's opinions. And sometimes we have factual information that the community doesn't have that that is really important and, and helpful in making those decisions. Um, the last question you had was, how can the parent body be more engaged? Um, to win the board. <laughs> and communicate with us and, you know, offer to help, offer to help anyone at the school, whether it's your teacher, whether it's Teresa, whether it's the office staff, whether it's us, if you've got an idea, throw it out there and, you know, take some swings and see what happens and find ways that you can help no matter what. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone, anyone else? Mr. Tanner, Nathaniel? I'm very satisfied with the other board members' responses. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I would just add on that uh, you asked about the skill sets. In addition to the initiation, um, in hearing all three of you talk tonight, I was thrilled to hear about somebody with experience in leadership institutes and, and that kind of training. And I'm thrilled to hear about somebody who was so excited about marketing and development and um, fundraising. I mean, that's a huge need for the school. I'm excited to hear about somebody who has experience with online SEO management and developing our digital presence. So, you know, as much as we are not a screen time school, um, that is very much a way that people find us. Um, and we can draw them in uh, that way. So that is definitely a need. Um, you know, we just did a website revamp, but it would be great to really push content through. Uh, we have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram account, uh, and you know, and, and just doing consistent, you know, emails uh, uh, both to the community uh, and uh, people we'd like to be a part of our community about who we are and what we can do. So I, I think all three of you um, have skill sets that we need and would like to see. So that, I'm excited. Uh, other questions? Well, I have an unusual question. Um, I don't think I'm the person for the board because I'm not involved in the school. I don't have a child there. It seems like some of the other candidates have a lot more going on. What I would like to offer, and I did this last time that we spoke, is to volunteer to do leadership workshops, to be involved in things like that, and to also be uh, listening to the board um, meetings. I know I can't be involved, but listening to the board meetings and then giving someone an idea of what how I could help in any way. So I think that having someone that um, has a child in your school and knows more about your school than I do. And maybe through the next year, I could learn more about your school and see how I can be involved. And then if you expand your board, um, then maybe there's a place for me. But I really don't think with my limited experience of what you're doing, that I would be the right board member. But I'm volunteering to do work. Well, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think we can let Lee take her piece off the board so easily. <laughs> oh, come on. I've been playing chess lately. I know how to do that. <laughs> um, well, I, I hear what you're saying, Lee, and I think it's, a, it's valid to be concerned. Do I know enough about the school to provide you know, something valuable uh, to the school? Um, but I think the answer, based on what I know about you so far, is unequivocally yes. And there are, it, the board is, uh, sits not at an operational level, but at a, or, you know, at a vision and direction and governance level, at least that's ideally where we'd be. Um, and having someone with your skill set, frankly, would be really valuable. Um, you know, coming in from the outside with that expertise, um, you know, the, whether you're doing the workshops or you're finding people to, mm -hmm. to hire for them or to coordinate, I mean, all of that would be 
hugely helpful and immediately helpful. And if you're going to be sitting through the board meetings anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you may, you may as well get the credit for for being a board member and and having a vote um, about the the long term vision of the school. Plus, you have lengthy Waldorf experience, um, and frankly, we're we, we would like to see more of that um, coming in on the board. And you also have the added benefit of not having any kids at the school, uh, which means that you don't have, a, you know, you're not quite tied as emotionally to what happens day to day, which means that it's a lot easier for you, for example, to take the long view um, about what the right thing to do is. So I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I, I know it's, not easy to jump headfirst into any new organization, but I really think that you have a valuable skill set, and you would be at a, a, a add a lot to our board composition in a lot of different ways. So um, I hope that you'll keep your application in. <laughs> um, I also want to mention one other thing. So my son is much older now, but he still has the values that I feel he got at Waldorf. And he's, he's matured, but he's coming from the heart. He's listening to people. He's being responsible. He takes uh, account for what he does. Um, and the spiritual aspect, um, he sees the world through those eyes of Waldorf. And so that's why I'm really excited about what you're doing. That's all that's I have great. to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but take some time to think about it. And, you know, I, I, I just know that your contributions, I think, would be very valued. Well, either way, I'm there to help. So whether I'm on the board or not, just let me know what I can do. Fair enough. Fair enough. Right. Other questions from the candidates? <laughs> Uh, Dan, I, I like this you. question. I like this question from Dan because I can't. I don't have to answer it because I can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying I don't really have any questions, so it's a win-win either way. I was, I've, I've heard a lot of questions asked, and I asked questions uh, during the initial meeting, and also have been listening for board meetings and talking and involved with the school. So, uh, not at this time. Mm. All right. Well, not hearing anything else, uh, I want to thank all three of you for being here tonight. I uh, really appreciate you putting in the time and showing up and offering such great ideas on the fly uh, while we were talking tonight. It's fun. I like your excitement. I'm excited to have you be a part of our community. And, um, you know, we'll, uh, we're not voting tonight, obviously, but um, you know, I'm, that will happen on November 18th, but, you know, I commend you all on your valuable skill sets um, and for offering your service to the school uh, in one way or another. So thank you very much. And so that brings us uh, to the end of our agenda at the remarkable hour of 8.20 p.m., <laughs> uh, which is... <laughs> Uh, a, 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 an achievement, months in the making, I think. So thank you, board members, uh, for all of your hard work uh, leading up to this meeting. Um, you know, we're making great progress and doing good work. So thank you for continuing to contribute. Uh, unless there's anything else. Um, okay, I will move to adjourn the meeting. I'll second it. <laughs> Any discussion? All, right, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Motion passes. I'll read the closing verse and we'll be adjourned. Uh, the most important task for humankind today and in the future is that we should learn to live together and understand one another. If this human fellowship is not achieved, all talk of development is empty. And that, again, is from Rudolph Singer. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.